So the first object that's in the image set, and I see that you have the hard copy of the new curriculum. Uh, I brought mine too. I think <coughs> you all know that it's accessible online. And if you look uh, at the, the image set for this particular section, the earliest uh, colonial object is a manuscript. It's the frontispiece of the Codex Mendoza. I actually have a facsimile of all of these manuscripts. I was going to bring them, but I couldn't carry them all, uh, so I wound up not uh, leaving it in my office. But uh, it's the frontispiece. Uh, <clears throat> I'll show you the image in a second, because I want to say something about these terms. It's this image that has that kind of cross motif with the eagle in the center. So we're going to look at that first. <clears throat> but before I do, I want to just to show you some terms that are associated with manuscript studies. Manuscript studies of the 16th century are its own body of scholarship. Okay, we talk about pre-Hispanic because natives had their own form of book production. We call them books, not quite books, but they had their own uh, tradition, manuscript traditions. Uh, some of these continue post-conquest, and some of these are lost. But book production becomes a major form of cultural production after contact as a way of gathering information about the natives. The king and the counselors, the people in Spain, want to learn about these new subjects and these new territories to learn how to better govern them, to find out where the resources are. Okay, So material is gathered. Information about native history, native culture, native religion uh, is gathered primarily uh, initially by the Franciscans. Okay, There are three religious orders. The first three religious orders that arrive in New Spain, first are the, the Franciscans, very important. They've left their stamp in Latin America. They're the first to arrive, and they're active throughout the entire colonial period. So we have the Franciscans. They arrive in the 1520s. Uh, then we have uh, the Augustinians. These are the, the, the first three. And then the Dominicans. And then later in the 16th century, we have the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a special, uh, a special case. <clears throat> So the Franciscans arrive first, then the Augustinians and Dominicans. And the friars really prefigure modern anthropology. They're like the first ethnographers. You know, I don't know if any credit is given to them in anthropology. But in the early 16th century, it's the friars who go out and live among the people. They learn the languages. They, pre they create the first dictionaries of native languages using the Roman alphabet. They gather, they interview people, and gather these encyclopedic collections uh, of data on native cultures, history, religion, et cetera. Uh, and so in a, they're like the first ethnographers. These, these people prefigure modern ethnography. They gather all this information with the intent of sending this to Spain so that the king and his advisors can review this material and not only learn about these exotic new lands, but also uh, come up with policy. Okay. So the terms, so manuscript studies, it's its own body of scholarship within colonial art history. And some of the terms that you'll find, of course, are book, codex. Uh, I typically refer to these as codices. Uh, tira, a Spanish word that means like a long, kind of scroll-like form. And then amushli. Amushli is the Nahuatl term, like what the Aztec called their manuscripts, amushli. So these terms are often used interchangeably although they mean slightly different things. So if you read anything, like an article or a blurb or a book on manuscripts, these are the terms that you're going to come across. But they're basically referring to the manuscripts. <clears throat> okay, So this, does it look different? Yes. Itself? Yeah, I'm going to show you in a second. So here's the, the, the work that's in the image set. Uh, uh, the artists are unidentified. We know they're native. All the artists were native in this early period. They, uh, the artists worked under the direction of the friars. So this is why when we talk about the 16th century, a lot of this early art has a very strong indigenous elements. It's because you have friars directing native artists who are used to their own traditions, their own aesthetics. They're being taught to produce uh, images along sort of a European tradition. Uh, naturalism doesn't exist among native art traditions. You know, so naturalism is a new kind of visual language. Uh, so you see different variations of it. Some of them look very stylized. Some of them copy exactly prints. They look like prints, you know. So, but during this period, because all the artists are native, okay, the Europeans are the minority still, uh, from like the 1520s till about the 1550s. All of the art that we see is produced by natives. <clears throat> so, the, the, this is the frontispiece. It's a European style book, which means it's bound and paginated with a hard cover. I really wish I'd been able to bring the, the facsimile so you could see it because it's stunning. Uh, okay, and what we're looking at, I mean, th when you open the cover. You turn a page, and then you have a page of text facing this. This is on the right side. 
Each of the images is accompanied by text that is explaining to an intended European audience what it is they're seeing. You know, the Aztecs didn't have alphabetic writing. It's pictographic. Okay, pictographic. So the friars who are collating this information with the help of natives have to uh, uh, um, include what are called glosses. A gloss is like an explanation. It's like writing, right next to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the natives and the friars worked on this. <clears throat> because the native language is pictographic, they're pictographs, it's not alphabetic. You know, someone in Europe is going to look at this and not really understand what they're seeing, so they have natives interpret what it is they're seeing, and someone's writing this down. And they write it either in Castilian, you know, the languages are Castilian, Latin, or Nahuatl. Those are the three languages that information is recorded in. Castilian, which is what we call Spanish, or it's in classical Latin, and sometimes in Nahuatl, which then requires further translation. That's the Aztec language. Okay, so you open it, turn the page, and this is the image you see on the right, and a text on the left, kind of narrating what this image is all about. Because what we're seeing in this image is typical of native map making. It conflates space, space and time. Our maps are purely geographic. They're all about like landscape and distance and scale. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the indigenous map making tradition is not purely geographic. They conflate history with space. That is, the locations that typically are noted in indigenous maps are locations where something significant occurred. Okay, the landscape is marked by significant events. Okay, those are the locations that get noted in native. So there's a conflation of space and time. So what we're looking at here is, on one hand, a representation, very abstract, of Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, which was an island city lined by canals. It was built in, in the lake. So that's what the blue is, and that cross it's divided into quadrants. I want to talk about that because it reflects the Nahua. That's another thing I should say before I continue because this sometimes can be confusing. Is that we use the term Aztec a little too loosely. Is that the indigenous people of central Mexico are known as Nahua. And underneath Nahua are multiple subgroups. The Aztec are one. Actually, they didn't call themselves Aztec. We think the word Aztec might have been invented by Lord Kingsborough in the 19th century. Uh, the word doesn't exist in Nahuatl. They call themselves, and you may see this in some scholarship, Mexica. Or another word tied to their city is Tenochca. These are the native terms that were used to refer to what we call the Aztecs. They call themselves Mexica. This is where the word for Mexico comes from later on. Uh, or Tenochca. You see the word Tenochca means the inhabitants of the city of Tenochtitlan. Okay. That's their city. Okay. But they're also like the Mixtec. The Mixteca or the Tlaxcalteca or the Huasteca. Although these are different uh, ethnic groups, they are all lumped underneath the Nahua umbrella. And they all speak variations of Nahuatl, which is the Nahua language. So Nahua is the name for the, the ethnic, the larger group. Their language is Nahuatl. N-A-H-U-A-T-L, Nahuatl. So, and there are other groups. But um, just to kind of help you understand that when we talk about the Aztec, uh, I, I've seen in some literature, incorrectly, Mixteca manuscripts identified as Aztec. They're not Aztec. The Aztec are specifically the inhabitants of Tenochtitlan. They are the rulers of all these other ethnic groups. The Aztec were an imperial colonial power. They were hated <laughs> by the other natives. That's another thing we have to kind of get rid of, the idea that the natives are one big happy group. We can't romanticize natives. Okay, they are different ethnically, they're different culturally, more powerful native groups subjected and conquered other native groups or enslaved other native groups. The Aztec Empire was a colonial empire. At the time of Spanish contact, we know that the Aztec were aggressively moving south into Mayan territories. By that point, the Mayan societies were already in decline. And we, found, we find Aztec colonies in Mayan territories towards the south. They didn't have any interest up here. They were moving south. There's an interesting volume. I can't remember who the editor was. It's like what if stories where like major historians were commissioned and asked to write. Like one, one, one historian who works on the Americas was asked, what would have happened if the Spanish had never arrived? 
So he wrote this interesting essay, hypothetical, and what he hypothesized is that the Aztec would have conquered all of the Americas. They were aggressively moving south. And at that point, the Inca Empire was in civil war. It was weakened. So if the Aztec had been allowed to continue for moving, they probably would have conquered the northern half and then eventually the southern half. So his suggestion that all of the Americas would have been Aztec. There would have been a huge, formidable American empire, <clears throat> you know, which is an interesting kind of thing to consider. But Nahua refers to all the central Mexican natives, and they can be broken down into different native groups. And the Aztec were specifically the Tenochca, or the Mexica, who lived in Tenochtitlan. They were the rulers, okay, who lived in the city, the capital of Tenochtitlan. And they ruled other societies, like the Mexteca and the Huasteca fell, they were subjected. The Tlaxcalteca had resisted Aztec domination. These are the ones that Cortes allied himself with. So the Aztec had tried to dominate the Tlaxcalteca, but they had resisted it. Okay, so when Cortes arrived, it was like martial law. I mean, they were like up in arms, like in defensive mode constantly to resist Aztec domination. Cortes, unlike Columbus, was very smart. And he realized early on the political conflicts between the different native groups, and he was able to form alliances with those native groups that, uh, had, they, that hated the Aztec. And it was through these alliances with these other native groups that they were able to conquer the Aztec. Like the enemy of your enemy is my enemy. And the Aztec. Yeah. It's a very interesting political situation. You know, um, I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but just to kind of briefly explain what's happening. Could you just say what you call all of these They're Nahua. They're all Nahua people. Okay. Yeah, that's the people Central Mexico. Okay, mm -hmm. They're Nahua, and they're different ethnic groups within the Nahua umbrella. <coughs> so the Mixteca are Nahua, the Huasteca are Nahua, Tlaxcalteca are Nahua. They all speak some form of Nahuatl. It's like a lingua franca. Okay. But usually what we're focusing on is the so-called Aztec, who are the, primarily the inhabitants of Tenochtitlan, okay, in the valley of Mexico. It's located in a, in a series of lakes that no longer exist, but in the valley, what was the valley? So what we're looking at here is a diagram of Mexico City. Okay, there are the canals. The eagle on the cactus ties back to Aztec mythology. Uh, the Aztec were migrants. They're outsiders. They're believed to have come up from somewhere up here. Some people think they may have come from Utah. Uh, actually, the languages, when you look at linguistics, there's a family of languages called uto aztecan that includes local native languages that are associated with Nahuatl. There seems to be a link between Nahuatl and local native languages up here. And there's like this idea that we know that the Aztec and the Mexica were outsiders. They had migrated from somewhere in the north and settled and then taken over the valley. Uh, so there's a possibility that they were from somewhere up here. Um, that's sort of the, the, what the mythology communicates. And then the fact that there's this linguistic, interesting linguistic connection suggests that it might be true, although some people have some questions about that story. But in any case, so the, the story about the Aztec migration, the Mexica migration, is that along the route they face certain challenges. And then uh, at, at the, they're, they're carrying an idol. That's like their patron deity, Huitzilopochtli. I'm not going to write these Aztec words because they're really long. <laughs> But Huitzilopochtli is uh, the god of war. He's their patron. He, they carry sort of an image of him with them and that he spoke to them. It sounds very Catholic. You know, a lot of these histories were written after the conquest, so I always take them with a grain of salt because they sound a little too European, a little too Christian. This idea of an, an idol talking sounds like very Catholic. You know, but apparently along the way, uh, Huitzilopochtli informed them that when you see an eagle with a serpent and it speak land on a cactus, that's where you build my shrine. In the beginning of every Aztec city is a shrine, and then the city is built around it. Okay, every like center of every Aztec city has a shrine, a temple in the middle, and the city is then built around it. So this is a, a story of the origin. It's like the Rome, Rome, the, the, the origin of Rome with the wolves and Remus and Romulus. Yeah, yeah. It's every major old city has its own founding myth, and for Mexico City, it's this. So you see that image of the eagle on the cactus, which goes back to the origin. Okay, then the canals. These are date glyphs. Okay, they refer to years. Okay, that mark the migration period for the Aztec. And then at the bottom, you have like a temple. You have two, two groups of pictographs, this one and that one. And each group it consists of three elements. One element is an exploding temple. We see a temple in profile, and the top's flying off, and there's smoke coming out. It's an exploding temple. That means conquest. 
It signifies conquest. And then you have a large figure that's the same in both cases, holding a club that's lined with blades, it's a macana, and a shield. That represents the Aztec Empire. And then the smaller figure is a little town that it conquers. And the little town, the shield changes to reflect the different town. So what we're looking at here is the foundation of Mexico City and then its first two conquests, which were the, the, the kingdom of Colhuacan and the kingdom of Tenayuca. Because it, it, there's a gloss written for the Spanish who are going to be reading it. It's explaining what we're seeing. So this is a history and a map. It has the history of the beginning of the Aztec Empire, and then it's a map. But what's interesting about it, I'm going to come back to this in a second, is that this is clearly the pictographs, the visual language is derived from native pictography. But if you look at the way that it's formatted on the page, it's formatted to fit a paginated book. This is brand new. So already we're starting to see that native visual languages are being altered to fit a European model, in this case, the book format. Because this is what, oh, and here's just the page that's opposite it that has the explanation of what I just told you. It's written in uh, Castilian. Okay. Well, I'm coming to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, I, I'm going to actually show you examples of what a mushli look like. But in terms of the quadrants, this is where we see another native uh, connection is I'm showing you uh, one of the few uh, manuscripts that is pre-contact. We don't have any Aztec manuscripts that survive pre-conquest. There are very few that survive that were made before the conquest, and they all come from outside of the valley. Okay? All of the manuscripts that were made by the Aztec were all burnt. The, the Aztecs had libraries, and uh, they, the friars burned all the libraries. They kept a few and sent them to Europe where they're in some, they were in curiosity cabinets and now they're in archives. But the vast, all the libraries were burnt, you know. So the vast majority of manuscripts were lost. So for the Aztec, we don't have any surviving manuscripts that predate the conquest. They're all colonial period productions. Outside of the valley, where societies are more dispersed, we have some surviving manuscripts that weren't touched by the Spanish. And this is one of them. This is actually Mishtec, which is one of the groups. <clears throat> okay, it's known as the Codex Virgivari Meyer. The Vatican has a lot of these. Uh, some of them are in England, some of them are in France. Um, it's dated roughly, we don't have an exact 14th century or so, pigment on paper. And there are two, you know, there are two images. What I want to focus is on, on this image to the right. Because what we're looking at here, here is a diagram, is a quadripartite cosmogram that reflects the native or Nawa concept of the universe. This is how the Nawa conceived of the structure of the universe, where you have a sacred center from which emanate like these four quadrants associated with the four directions. Okay, so this is how they conceived <clears throat> of the structure of the universe. <coughs> and they replicate this in their urban planning. Their cities are like microcosms of the universe. Every city has a, a sacred precinct in the center, and it's divided into quadrants. Tenochtitlan uh, was divided into quadrants and had a sacred precinct. So you see that this model becomes the source for urban planning. Okay, they recreate the structure of the universe in their cities. Yeah. Survived. That's not quite true. A couple survived because the friars sent them to Europe. We uh, have them in our uh, Actually, they, I don't think the ones that, I don't know if they're Aztec. They might have been from some of these outlying areas. Okay. Yeah, this, this is Mishtec. It's not Aztec. Oh. That's what I was saying. Oh. It's Mishtec. Yeah, those survived because the Spanish didn't get their hands on them. You know, the, the, the libraries in the valley were all concentrated in the city. It was easy for them just to go through and ransack the libraries and burn everything. But outside, in all the different towns, some things survive. So you know. the yeah. Well, I mean, the problem is that the friars, the friars didn't understand what they were looking at. You have to, you have to kind of look at the, that edited volume I mentioned that was produced by the Getty. You should take a look at that, some of those essays, because you have to look at what's happening in Europe at this time. There's this concern with uh, pa uh, paganism, you know, uh, uh, like classical archaeology is kind of taking off. Uh, and one of my advisor, Tom Cummins, notes in his article that right when uh, ancient Greek art is kind of, and Roman art is being discovered, it's discovered at the same time that Aztec art is entering the European imaginary. And they're both pagan, but Greek art becomes art. Mm -hmm. And Aztec art becomes idolatry. There's a distinction made from the very beginning. And they're both pagan. They're not Christian, but why is it that one 
is absorbed into art and the other one is relegated to historical artifact or idolatry. Uh, well, think about it. <laughs> yeah. One's a dead religion and the other one's still surviving? Possibly. That could be one of the reasons. You know, that's like a, a question that's being considered. You know, why, why does that happen at the very same time? So there's a concern in the Catholic world with idolatry. So the Franciscans look at them, they don't know what they're looking at. They can't read this material. You know, they see it as satanic, as diabolical. You know, and from their perspective, it's pagan and satanic, and it's evil, and it must be destroyed. So they burn. Oh, oh. Versus this is like it's, it's very stylized. Abstract. Yeah. Yeah. So right. Going, mm -hmm. So it must be bad, and it's evil. Yeah. And also, I mean, the human sacrifice is exaggerated. I mean, that's one of the things that happens too in the historiography is that human sacrifice was conducted at various times because it was part of the religious belief. You know, uh, and, uh, and so the, the, of course that shocked. That shocked the, the Europeans. The Spaniards who were seeing this were shocked by human sacrifice, which was an interesting thing because when you think about Catholicism, you have Christ on the cross and you drink his blood and eat his flesh. And the natives, that was not lost on the natives. You know, they accepted Christianity because they understood it. They're like, oh, cannibalism, human sacrifice. You know, it made sense to them. What didn't make sense was virginity. They never got that. You know, the fact that a virgin could give birth. The Mayan were totally stumped by that. You know, that's an interesting thing about translation, which is a whole other lecture, is that uh, one of the things the friars were doing, besides learning native languages, one of the reasons for learning native languages is they, were, they wanted to translate the Bible to make it more accessible to uh, uh, native groups. And uh, what winds up happening is that there's certain concepts in the Bible that don't exist among natives. Sin. There's nothing like that. The devil doesn't exist. You know, uh, for one of the Nawa groups, for instance, uh, there's this entity that's like this a nocturnal owl-like creature that inhabits the night. The friars were like, oh, OK, they don't have a devil, but that's sort of like the devil. So in their translation, they refer to that owl creature in the place of the devil. OK? So what you wind up seeing is that the Bible gets Indianized because native ideas are preserved. So when natives read it, they're seeing things they already recognize, you know? So, and, and then like Virginia, there's like a case where uh, the Maya just were stumped by the virgin birth. It just made no sense to them. Because the natives observe nature. You know, their thinking's very logical, actually, because they, they observe nature and the natural cycles, and their understanding of the world is based on what they observe, you know, and that informs their belief systems. <laughs> you know, so now they're introduced to this kind of uh, religious kind of uh, way of thinking that is not based <laughs> on nature, or it seems odd to them. You know, some, and, and there were natives that just re rejected Catholicism. <laughs> there are cases where they're like, what is this craziness? They're like, no. <coughs> yeah. 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 That would be an interesting edited volume, to have chapters on all the different libraries throughout history that have been destroyed. Because it's power. Because evil, but it was also to erase the That's right, exactly. Yes, exactly. It's what's going on. Yeah, they're destroying their memory, you know, the foundation of their knowledge. You know, it's power. You know, if you destroy these things. Yeah, we put them in a generation. They're, yeah. They're not going to have, right. unless they have a really strong oral tradition, yeah. they're not going to have these books. And, and manuscripts, I mean, they adapt to the book, I mean, to the European version of bookmaking. So manuscripts continue to be produced throughout uh, the 16th century. Right. Right. Uh, so anyways, I just wanted to show you sort of uh, uh, this particular diagram to kind of help you understand that, that kind of quadripartite design of uh, what we see here that is a reflection of Mexico City. It's divided into its quadrant because it's based on a Nahua conception of the universe that gets replicated in the urban planning. Okay, but... Uh, Excuse me. You said you, that the date was up. And where was the date again? Uh, which date? You said that it had dates. Yeah. Th these little boxes are individual years and it marks the years of migration, okay? But here, what you're seeing is it's like along the page. I'm gonna show you examples. Oh, I guess I'm not showing examples yet. <laughs> what I'm gonna show you is uh, uh, more uh, uh, pages or sections from the manuscript. The thing about the Codex Mendoza that's interesting is divided into three sections. That's what I have here. The first section uh, is dynastic history. Okay, and that is, it traces each of the Aztec emperors, there are 12. It traces each of the previous Aztec emperors. So you see the date glyphs. These are the number of years each emperor ruled. So this emperor is a Kamapichli, the first one. These are the number of years. You count each box. Each box is a year. Those are the number of years he ruled. And then you see that exploding temple again. These uh, are references to each of the towns that were conquered during his reign. Okay, so each emperor has his own section. A Kamapichli is the first. 
And then uh, Montezuma's grandfather, I mean, Montezuma, who was the emperor at the time of Spanish contact, uh, this is his page, Moctezuma Xocoyotzin is his full name, that has the years that he ruled, okay, not very many because he was interrupted by the conquest, but he conquered a lot of towns you know, during his brief reign. Yes, yeah. So you see the temple looks the same, because that's the verb. It's conquest. The town is signified by this logo, what's called a logograph. That's, it refers to a name. So each little temple has a different name. That's a different town that was conquered during the reign of this emperor. So this is the first section of the codex. After the frontispiece, when you look, the first section is dynastic history. Each emperor has his own section with the number of years he ruled in each of the territories that he conquered, or towns that he conquered during his reign. The second section, uh, oh, and then at the end of the dynastic history, you have a couple of pages that note all of the imperial outposts. These are like military outposts throughout the empire. So that's what we see here. These are logographs again. They're little towns. And then there's a little gloss in Spanish to kind of identify the name of the town you know, for its European intended audience. So we have then a listing of all the imperial outposts. And then the second section is what's called a tribute list. The Aztec subjected territories and demanded tribute. The Spanish recognize this because it seems very feudal. You know, the Aztecs own land, everybody works and gives them tribute. So it was like a feudal-like system which the Spanish recognized. <clears throat> so that's their social system. You know, so, and the tribute list gives us a better idea of the kinds of tribute that subject territories would give several times a year to Tenochtitlan. So what we're looking at is very complex. So you have the towns. These are the towns okay, along the border. And then in the center, you see the goods. The, these objects are mantles. They're textiles. And these are military uniforms with helmets. And these are shields. Okay? And if you look at the mantles, for instance, you have this little black thing that looks like a brush. It looks like this. See that? That's a quantitative glyph. It tells you how many. You know? So uh, we have like a 20. That means 20. So 20 of that mantle, some of them are very elaborate. Some are the, so there are 20 of those, 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 20 of each. One of the, and, and here you have like, looks like a banner. Okay? So then it tells you how many of these, how many of these. So each town had to donate all of these objects. They got this quantity and type of from each village in each town. There's a lot of material coming in. Sometimes there are food products. You see beans or honey, you know, on a certain bo like 500 bushels or 20. You know, it's a lot of material. If each of these towns has to donate that number of products, that's a lot of material coming in to the Aztec capital. So the second, so it's like an accounting list, an inventory. They keep an inventory. It's like accounting of the tribute they receive. That's the second section. Yeah, the, the, the way that the Aztec Empire was structured, you have these cabeceras, these large administrative centers. They're the larger towns, and then the smaller towns or villages around them. Yeah, well, it's not really a state, but it's sort of like uh, it's a larger town that is an administrative center, okay, that it, it kind of uh, governs the smaller villages or towns around it. So this is the list for the area around Akolwakan. This is the list for the area around Cuajnahuac, what is today Cuernavaca. It's like a vacation town for wealthy Mexicans now. So that, that's the second section, tribute list. And we found a fragment. There's a fragment of an earlier tribute list that was pre-contact, pre-conquest, that we know must have been a model for this. It's gone now. It doesn't exist. but. This was clearly based on a fragment. Uh, I, I don't remember who has the fragment, uh, but there is a fragment of a tribute list that had to have been, because it's identical to some of these pages, uh, was a copy. This was copied for this manuscript, specifically to be sent. Okay. So the first section is a dynastic history. Second section is a tribute list. The third section is something we've never seen before among the Aztec. And I'll explain that shortly. And we see in the third section illustrations of cultural practices. So on the left is a section that shows the education of Aztec children. And the Aztec didn't play. <laughs> they were disciplinarians. So what we're looking at here <clears throat> on the left, going down, you see like these registers that show a boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. 
So it's a, a boy on one side and a daughter on the right side. <coughs> and the little uh, blue circles indicate the age. So it's three years old. So this is at three years old, what they get to eat is half a tortilla because it has half a tortilla right next to them. That's what they eat per day. They are fed half a tortilla per day. And it shows you how they're taught. So the little boy at three years old, he's given half a tortilla. The little girl, uh, when they get a little older, they're four years old, they start to do chores. And now they're fed a whole tortilla at four. The little boy is helping carry water. He's carrying things around the house. The little girl is watching her mother spin and weave. And when they get to be five years old, the little boy now uh, uh, helps like, look for firewood, kindling. That's what is illustrated here. And the little girl is learning how to spin again. Uh, when they get to be six years old, uh, the little boy helps in food gathering. Uh, the little girl spinning herself under her mother's supervision. So it shows you how they're educated. And there's an interesting page that shows how the children are punished when they misbehave. And there are two punishments that really stand out. Uh, if your kids were like being mouthy or not following what you're telling them to do, you would start a fire and throw chilies in there. And then you would hold them and put their face in the smoke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Or you would make them, you would, they slept on mats. You would put a mat outside and wet it and make the child sleep nude outside <laughs> overnight on a wet mat. It gets very cold. These are the two like, major punishments that are illustrated here. So the Aztec didn't play. They punished their kids you know, kept them disciplined. In addition to like, the education of children, you also have like, different kinds of cultural rituals. Like, this is identified as marriage. And to me, it sounds a little Christian. You know, it seems like the seven sacraments, the way this is uh, organized. Because you can tell that the friars are looking at Aztec culture through their understanding of culture. And their understanding of culture is informed not only by Catholicism, by sort of classical models of culture. So often in a lot of these manuscripts, the way that the native information is organized resembles like Catholic ideas, like the sacraments and things of that sort. But in any case, what we're looking at here is a kind of union between a man and a woman, which has been called like marriage. You know? So basically, this is the ritual, where the man and the woman, their cloaks are tied. Uh, the people running the, the ritual are the elders. The elders have all the power in Aztec society. The elderly, the seniors, are the ones that run the show. They are given all sorts of privileges. Uh, they are the, the ones with all the wisdom. Uh, so you see two elderly people sitting on either side, kind of reciting prayers or songs. You know? uh, and then the man carries the woman. To, his, to her new home. He's carrying her on his back right here. And people are following them with torches. Okay, So this kind of uh, is identified as like their version of marriage. Whether it is or not, we don't know. But this is how it was sort of uh, perceived and documented. So that's the third section, different kinds of cultural practices. There's another section in the cultural practices that identifies all the different ranks of the military, like the different military uniforms and whatnot. And what's interesting about the third section, oh, here I'm going to show you, I'm going to say a little bit more, is that before Spanish contact, when you look at pre-contact manuscripts, the kinds of information that were deemed worthy of recording were uh, uh, histories, dynastic histories, like the first section, tribute lists, like the second section, or calendrical and religious information. Those are the three subjects that were deemed worthy of being documented in pre-contact manuscripts. Yeah, so the, the subjects that were recorded in manuscripts that were produced before European contact were, like we see in the first two sections here, dynastic histories, of course, the history of the rulers that validates their authority, tribute lists, which is the economic element, and then calendrical or religious information, like rituals, religious rituals and whatnot. Cultural practices like this, you never see documented. Why would they want to document <laughs> you know, the life ways of the people? You know, they're not, you don't see this kind of information before, con this is something clearly that's of interest to Europeans. Kind of that ethnographic data collecting practice. But they're, they're practicing it. Yeah, so you never see this until the Spanish arrive. So the Codex Mendoza is divided into these three sections, dynastic history, tribute list, and then a brand new form of, of information that we haven't seen before is just daily practices, cultural practices and rituals. Now, going back to the question of what these things look like, so these are uh, some reconstructions of native Amushli. Uh, and it was an accordion fold. It's also called an accordion fold. Fold manuscript. 
And another term that comes from European manuscript studies that we use when we talk about the way information is composed on the page is boustrophedon or boustrophedon, which refers to when you're looking at a manuscript, this kind of movement when you're reading across a page. It's a, a, a type of paper known as amak, which is a kind of tree bark. Amak, A-M-A-T-L. That's where the word amushli comes from. A-M-A-T-L, amak. It's a kind of paper, locally made paper. After European uh, contact, then they start using uh, European-made paper. Amat continues to be used, but then they also start using vellum in some cases. But traditionally, before contact, it's this, uh, locally produced paper, amat. Oh, um, I'm sure we do. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that date. It's been a while. I mean, they have a, a very ancient manuscript tradition. <coughs> you look at the Maya, who are even older, and they have writing. So we know it goes back centuries, maybe like a thousand years or more. So this is what the emotionally look like. They're like these long, this is a tira. This is what a tira is, that term, T-I-R-A. It's a long strip like this. Okay, that's a tira. And they were like folded, like an accordion fold when they were put away and then opened. And what we know, and you can see the pictographs uh, are arranged in what's known as a, a scattered attribute. That's one of the terms to describe how these images are composed. Scattered attribute. That is, these images don't, there's no background, it's just the white paper, and images are just placed on the surface. Scattered attribute is the term that Donald Robinson, who was the first American art historian at Yale uh, to begin studying colonial manuscripts within the context of art history, uh, he coined some terms that we continue to use. And that was one of his terms, the way that these images are just placed on the picture surface. It's a scattered attribute. So this is what they look like. So when you think about what these images look like, originally these books, the date glyphs, those date glyphs that I pointed out, those little boxes that mark years, would have been across, running all the way across. It would have run across horizontally, the entire theta, okay, with different events yeah. illustrated. So if there was a shorter one, like the, so meaning that it would be continuous. Yes. Okay. So when you look at the Codex Mendoza, you can see how it's already being reformatted to fit the page. Uh, the date glyphs don't run across because it's been paginated. Now it runs across. It forms like a border now along the edges of the page. So already we're seeing how an indigenous visual language is being altered. You know, so we're seeing the coming together of a European kind of object, a book with native material, and it's producing a new kind of object. So here's just side by side. This is a, a, a Namoshli next to a, a late 16th century uh, manuscript that we're going to look at shortly kind of show you what happens. So if you're going to cut these things up, some of these were literally cut up and then bound. Uh, but when they started producing these during the early colonial period, in a book format, they had to make some changes to the native visual language so that it fits one page. And what's interesting about these is that the material book gives us some indication on cognitive processes, how natives think. Because when you look at the theta, you could start at any point and go backwards and forwards. It's very organic and fluid. There's no beginning and there's no end. You can start and move back, forward, up, down. Very organic, very fluid, sometimes cyclical. Okay? And then when you look at the European book, it's a very different way of thinking about information. It's in a sequence and it's segmented. It's a very different way of thinking and of time. You know, so the object itself gives us some indication of how people organize information and how they think of time. You know, so that's something that's, to me, fascinating about manuscript studies, when you see things like this. You know, in order to accommodate native knowledge to a European format, you need to start altering this language into this kind of segmented, sequential form. Okay? 